Hello, hey. global audience, and hello, Randall. What's going on? Hi. This is the 2020 series presented by the New York Film Academy. The 2020 series is our conversations with artists and creatives and visionaries all about craft, creativity, and collaboration. And we get really granular. And it's for you know every artist out there. People want to be filmmakers. People want to make things. Um, I talked to brilliant minds. Uh, Randall and I will have 20 minutes of conversation, which we could go on for days about. And then we're going to take um, questions from you, the global audience, for about 20 minutes. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. So please write in. And without further ado, I'd love to present a brilliant visionary writer, director, educator, one of super respect, Randall. Hello. Liz, Liz, thank you so much for inviting me to come through and, and chat a little bit, talk a little bit about the craft, uh, about the, the, the joy and the struggles of being creative. Uh, it's really, it's really cool. So I appreciate the invite and I'm glad to be here. Thank you. So I want to jump right in. There was a great story we talked about mm -hmm. when you were working um, at Spike Lee's company mm -hmm. and basically the call came, like the studio called or, you know, you got the call from the studio that you're in, man. And then it seemed that would probably be your seminal moment of decision of um, whether to stay at Spike's or go to film school. And I just want you to walk me through that a picture of that and and what was that like for you? And, and what was the decision you were weighing? Yeah, and so, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, look, we're working for Spike Lee, uh, I got an internship in 1993 uh, when I was a junior uh, at Dartmouth College. I got an internship to work at, at 40 Acres and the Mule. Um, Spike Lee had just gotten a six picture deal um, after the like huge success of Do the Right Thing. And so I, you know, went to New York, you know, for the summer. Um, I had only found out about Spike Lee, I think, five years earlier. Um, and Spike Lee was one of the reasons why I decided to become uh, a filmmaker. So it was great uh, working there because I read scripts every day. I always tell, you know, people, I think I'm, I must have read 80 scripts, you know, over the course of like two months and, uh, and real coverage on those scripts. And it was amazing because it was like at the height of Spike Lee's power. And so like, I would see everybody like one time Denzel Washington called and I like got shook, you know, it was Denzel, you know, I, mean, I was just like, oh my goodness, um, Spike Lee threw his block party. Um, and so, you know, and so typically it was in Brooklyn, you know, right, uh, right around the corner from, um, I think, what is it like Brooklyn, Brooklyn Tech. And, uh, and I just saw all the, all the people who had acted as movies and like various celebrities, Buster Rhymes, Wesley Snipes. I mean, like everybody was just hanging out. It was incredible. Um, and, um, and so I got caught up in that. It was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. But I also learned a tremendous amount. I learned about the kind of rigor that you had to apply, uh, you know, to your work. Um, and that kind of became a really important thing for me to remember as, you know, I started making my own work more frequently. And, um, you know, there was an opportunity uh, uh, to, to go forth and continue, you know, working for Spike. Cause Spike, uh, Spike was doing diversity and inclusion, you know, on his sets um, in his company before that became a, um, before it became like a catchword. So on, on She's Gonna Have It, there were uh, Asian Americans, there were Latinos, of course there were African Americans. And it was just a situation with all kinds of people, you know, kind of together making movies and making films. Um, and I would say that probably 75% of the people that I know working in the industry right now started at 40 Acres and the Mule, because Spike Lee was very insistent on making sure that he demystified the process of filmmaking for uh, Black folks, Latinos, Asians, people of color, um, LGBTQ, you know, plus, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I, I, I had a situation where, uh, but it was, it was a lot of, I mean, it was a lot of work. I mean, and Spike recognized that, especially after the success of Do the Right Thing, he, there was a lot of pressure on him to kind of keep producing films, uh, uh, you know, that were cultural events, you know, which his films just were. 
And, um, and so it was a lot of work. I mean, I, you know, I interned and I was there, you know, from nine in the morning, typically till seven o'clock, you know, at night reading scripts and whatever, you know, um, he wanted to have, you know, uh, done, done. And so, um, there came a moment, you know, where, um, I was thinking about, um, you know, whether or not I wanted to see if I could go back to 40 Acres and the Mule after I graduated from Dartmouth or um, kind of kind of go my own path. And ultimately, you know, um, I decided to go my own path because, uh, and, and go to film school. Uh, and it was that summer that I made that decision that I was going to go to film school because um, I knew at that moment that film school was going to do three things for me. Um, one, I would have the opportunity to immerse myself in the process of making movies, one. Uh, two, I would have access to an incredible network of people um, uh, that were as passionate about making movies, you know, as I was. And to this day, um, most of the jobs that I've gotten in the industry have been um, through my friends that I met at film school. You know, I'm working on a, on a, on a project for Ford Foundation right now. It's a web series that's gonna be animated. And uh, I was hired by two of my friends from Columbia, uh, where I went to, to film school. And then three, um, uh, you know, three, I wanted to come out of uh, film school with a product. And so I knew that working for Spike, I, you know, I would gain experience, uh, you know, working on his, on, on his films and working on films that 40 Days and the Mule kind of put out. But uh, I wanted to be able to come out with my own product rather than spend five to 10 years, you know, working, you know, in, uh, at a production company where I was kind of really, really focused, you know, on the work that whoever I was working for was doing. And so that's when I kind of decided, let me, you know, uh, let me put myself in a situation where I can produce my own work and have, you know, my work kind of stand on its own. Um, instead of just saying, uh, I work for Spike, you know, and, you know, here's my business card, you know, what's up? Well, um, when did you, what took, took over first? Was it your passion for filmmaking? Did you feel, or cause I'm hearing also that you had such a great business sense very early on about uh -huh. like film is a business. Yeah. And, and typically, you know, us, both of us being educators, we, I, we find that, the film students don't quite until you know almost too late they realize oh it's a business yeah. and it's a passion so right. so where did the business sense come f uh, from you you know where did that evolve from um i mean the business sense evolved you know um from really from actually making films and putting them out into the marketplace um my you know and 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 really from um you know, the guys who uh, helped me raise money for my, for my films. And so um, the two people specifically, uh, my friend Maurice Coleman uh, and my cousin, Ron Dotton. You know, Ron uh, worked at JP Morgan uh, when I was in film school. And so he would write the first checks, you know, for, uh, for the films I was making. And his, you know, um, he, you know, always, just kind of ask questions, you know, about what I was doing to kind of get the word out. I mean, this is before like social media hit, like right before, like, you know, I made my thesis in like 2003 um, uh, and it won the student Oscar in 2004. Uh, and so like, but it was a situation where it was like, okay, be able to get your business, you know, uh, you know, sense, you know, together, um, understand that when you uh, make a movie, um, that you're only halfway there when you finish that movie. And so like, you know, in film school, the big prize that we finished and that we screened our film at a festival. Um, but when you're talking about feature films, uh, when you're talking about, you know, the actual business of, of making movies, what typically happens is that, you know, you make your feature, you, you finish it, and then, you know, the process to get it out to the world, to market it, distribute it, you know, make money, et cetera, et cetera, uh, you know, is, is another, you know, year or two. And so, um, you know, I always tell people, it's like when you make a movie, you really get to decide how, um, how important that story is to you because that movie is three to five years of your life. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, 
from, from my cousin Ron. Um, but also, I mean, you know, uh, one of the incredible things that, that, that Spike Lee did uh, is that he would, uh, in, with his first five films, he would write uh, a book uh, of the film uh, that, you know, for each of his movies. So from She's Gotta Have It through like Malcolm X, and typically within that book would be the screenplay uh, for whatever movie he had, and also kind of like a journal of his journey to making that uh, to making that film. And so that also really kickstarted my business sense, just how uh, he had to maneuver, how he dealt with casting, how he dealt with you know the creative challenges of writing and stuff like that, how he dealt with the studios. Um, you know, there's a brilliant story about how he dealt with whether or not he's going to shoot on Morehouse's campus when he did School Days. And so all these stories kind of helped me kind of think about. Um, you know, the business you know, and, 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 and just keeping my eye on the business because, you know, as you know, it's like, you know, you, they, you know, what we, what we do is called show business, you know what I mean? And there's, there's both show and business, you know what I'm saying? And without the, without the business, you know, uh, people don't get to see the show. Exactly. Exactly. And what coming, um, coming up, what formed your voice and, and tell us yeah. like what you're interested in, in putting out there. Yeah, I mean, you know, what forms my voice, I mean, I, you know, I, came, I became a filmmaker, you know, primarily, you know, um, by, by looking out of windows. You know, I grew up in, in housing projects uh, in Cambridge, um, uh, and I lived on the third floor uh, of, my, of my project, you know, building. And so living on the third floor of the projects, I had like a really incredible vantage point. I could see so much what was going on in the neighborhood. And I wanted to make films kind of based on what I saw you know, um, uh, on the street. And I also wanted to make films based on what I didn't see in the movie theaters. And so I, you know, uh, looking out, you know, of my window, you know, in the late seventies, early eighties as a kid, you know, I didn't see on screen um, black people, Latinos, uh, uh, you know, being, being represented with the complexity and, and, and having stories told with the complexity uh, that I witnessed. And so, uh, I wanted to, as a result, get out there and make my own movies. But I also, you know, you know, for me, in my, my a lot of my stories are stories of identity. Um, uh, you know, specifically black identity. Um, I think that, which is American identity, because I think, you know, overall the story, you know, of America, because we're such a young country, is the story of identity. You know, who are we going to become? Can we live up to the values that? Uh, we profess, uh, you know, in our creed. And so, and I think for African Americans, you know, because of our history in this country, um, you know, there, we have a particular response to that. And we have a particular um, uh, uh, story that comes out of that search, you know, for identity. Uh, and so, and so, you know, and it's led us, I think, as African Americans to create culture in a very specific way um, to create, you know, American culture. Uh, and so, uh, so, you know, the themes that I typically deal with, I mean, I, I'm, I'm definitely dealing with identity um, uh, because that's kind of like the key theme, whether I'm making a family film or a thriller or, uh, or even kind of like a documentary, you know, which I'm kind of working on right now. Uh, it's definitely identity, but I'm also kind of working out the themes of, of struggle, consciousness and joy because I feel like in the experience uh, of African-Americans, uh, we, you know, these themes kind of keep on coming up, um, when, and especially in the context of, of, of Black identity. So just real quickly, it's like when you, when you talk about struggle, um, you know, some people know, most people don't, that, you know, the first person that was killed on the American side of the American Revolution was a Black man you know, Crispus Attucks um, in Boston, you know, he was, he was the first, you know, person, the first American who was killed. Um, you know, there's obviously also the trauma, you know, of slavery there's, you know, and, and, and trying to create yourself, um, you know, when uh, purposely history has been kind of taken away from you. Um, uh, you know, obviously, you know, there's issues that, that, that African Americans bring to the table in terms of dealing with, you know, how, how, what are the cases in which we sabotage ourselves? Um, so this, this, this struggle is really, really important, you know, because it kind of leads to this whole idea of consciousness, you know, this whole idea uh, that, that, 
that we are able to now kind of understand, you know, our position and express our creativity uh, as a result of that consciousness, you know, um, as a result of be, being able to create things like gospel music, like jazz, uh, you know, like hip hop, uh, coming out of that consciousness, just the whole idea that we're here, you know, we don't struggled, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but this is what we've created out of that, you know, we've created you know, all types, all, all forms of expression. And then just lastly, joy, you know, the whole idea that, you know, that I think a lot of people get it twisted that, 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 that black folks and that, and that our stories are only about our trauma, you know, um, but our, the stories are, are also about joy, you know, um, I'm going to post uh, just a whole bunch of, of, of influences. One of the influences, um, I want to post is, uh, is a video montage by author Jaffa uh, called Love is the Message, the Message is Death. And, um, and, Arthur, and, it's, and it's just like a brilliant, beautiful um, montage about just the complexity uh, and just kind of like the multivalence of African Americans. Um, the good, the bad, the, you know, the, the tricky, the ugly, everything, but I think it's an incredible expression. But for me, it's like, that's what my work, you know, my work is kind of like formed by identity and then it's kind of shaped by the struggle. It's shaped by consciousness. It's, it's shaped by joy because this is kind of what, uh, these are themes that come up. It's not like a list that I create, like, boom, I got to do this, 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 and this, but it's a situation where it's like, oh, it's like, I'm, I'm writing this, a very simple story and these things are coming up. They're just coming through you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And how, how has filmmaking, you know, the process and the, the ups and downs of filmmaking transformed your identity? How the ups and downs transform my identity? Um, that's a great question. Um, I think that, um, I think primarily through uh, it, it, film, I love using film as a way to communicate with the world. And, you know, I started off, you know, my career as a playwright. Um, uh, you know, I went to, I went to, um, you know, to Dartmouth and they didn't have um, a production component, a strong production component to their film department. So I did a lot of theater and, um, and I wrote plays and, um, and you know, plays are about language, you know, they're about ideas and they're, you know, uh, and, and emotion, but they're about, they're primarily about language and what happens, you know, when char as characters talk to each other. But film, um, uh, because, but film kind of gives you a different kind of intimacy uh, mm -hmm. because you have, you know, this whole idea of the close up and, and you know, on, 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 on the stage, on theater, you know, you hear a soliloquy and, and in that way, you are, you have access to what a character is thinking and feeling. But, you know, with film, you can just do a close up mm -hmm. and, you know, you can figure out, you know, what a character is thinking and feeling uh, just, you know, via a close up. Mm -hmm. And so the opportunity to, to be able to show people very intimately and to use visuals um, as opposed to just relying on language, um, you know, is very, is very, very helpful. Uh, and to also think about limitations in terms of, uh, you know, how financial limitations, um, about how limitations of technology shape, you know, what you do are things that I've, um, in the process of making movies, I've had to make just like adjustments, but I think that it's all a part of just being creative in general, because I think that there's an idea, there's a concept that, you know, we make movies, we get to the Spielberg level, we get to the Jordan Peele level, you know, uh, the level that, you know, Nora Ephron was on or whatever, you know, Greta Gerwig and boom, we're good, we're straight, we're, you know, we're, we're on the road. But it's like, you know, the thing of it is, is that, you know, everybody has these creative challenges and, and film, I think, enables you to increase uh, your rigor you know, when you're kind of moving forward um, uh, and, and trying to make a story. That is exactly, exactly. And it's also the, the challenges, it's almost like the universe is coming back to you and showcasing things to you and, yep. and revealing things about your own 
personality or your quirks or things that you put in your own way by the yeah. challenges, by how the universe is speaking back to you about right. stuff. You're right. talking about your influences and, and you have an amazing list. So if you wanted to just share with us, you don't have to physically share, but just tell me some of the stuff that, that excites you. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, you know, because I grew up in the eighties, I'm, I'm a really big fan of hip hop. And so, um, you know, just because of its ability to kind of shape culture, to shape, uh, you know, what people are thinking about to kind of provide a message. And so, um, you know, there's an incredible freestyle, um, you know, that was lit, put out by Black Thought of the Roots. Um, and he did that freestyle on Funk Flex's, you know, show. Um, it's a 10 minute freestyle. And he just freestyled from the top of his head. He just rapped from the top of his head for 10 minutes. And, um, and he talks about, you know, what goes on in the streets. He talks about Voltaire. I think he brings up, you know, F. Scott Fitzgerald. Uh, I mean, you know, he talks about, you know, uh, you know, the whole term, you know, pre-Kardashian Kanye, that was like coined by Black Thought, you know what I'm saying? And so uh, that's, I mean, it's just an incredible expression. Uh, and that, you know, and again, it's like it comes from, you know, it, 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 he's kind of born out of that experience. He's born, you know, Black Thought's born out of the experience as being a member of the roots, you know, that experience of struggle, consciousness, you know, and, 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 and joy. So I got that in there. Um, also the trailer from Daughters of the Dust, um, you know, which is uh, a film that just kind of in influenced me in a profound way. Um, I think that, that, you know, oftentimes direct, you know, we, we um, well, it's just a film uh, Daughters of the Dust is a film um, I feel that can only be made, you know, uh, by a black woman. And I feel like that film is one of, you know, a number of films made by black women that is able to really kind of dramatize, um, you know, whether it be personality, uh, rituals, culture, fears, um, you know, talking about being mothers. I mean, the, the, the movie is a modern masterpiece. Um, it's also filmed by, directed by Julie Dash. Daughters of the Dust was also uh, photographed by Arthur Jaffa, who is just a genius. Um, and he trained uh, cinematographers like Bradford Young, uh, you know, who uh, photographed Arrival. Um, he also photographed Pariah by D. Reese. Uh, I mean, he's, you know, Bradford Young is now in the Pantheon. So that's the Dodge of the Dust. I mean, it's just, it's an incredible film. It's, I, I can't, I mean, you know, that's a, that's, that's a whole 2020 series or more. Um, I also got uh, Ilya Kazan, you know, what makes the director. Um, Ilya Kazan um, uh, was the director who uh, essentially uh, discovered Marlon Brando um, and directed Marlon Brando in A Streetcar Named Desire. Um, uh, he also, uh, did incredible, an incredible job with Tennessee Williams work, the playwright Tennessee Williams. Uh, and he was just, you know, one of our, one of our great directors, one of the great American directors. And he gave a speech at Wesleyan University, I think in 1972, and he talked to the Wesleyan students about what makes a director. Uh, and essentially, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's something that I, you know, used to give to, um, my directing students on the first day, you know, of class. Um, uh, but he, he really just talks about being a lifelong learner. Like one of, the, one of the things that I've learned about being a screenwriter and being a director is that you're in a constant state of learning. You know, you, 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 you keep moving forward. You keep, uh, uh, you know, working your craft uh, and improving your craft by learning, you know. And he talks about how important it is to know the different kind of uh, you know, the, the, the different kind of food tastes of, of, of cultures around the world. He talks about directors should know dance. He talks about, you know, uh, directors should know psychology and history, you know, um, and just really being a well-rounded person, being a Renaissance person, because that only helps your directing. So it's a really, really great article. Um, I also, you know, some of my students, you know, who are on this know that I love Star Wars. And so like, I mean, I can't, you know, I mean, they're, they, some of them don't even like me anymore because I talk too much about Star Wars, you know what I mean? Uh, so I had to kind of like drop the original trailer for Star Wars, not like the slick joint, but like the version that they put out when they were still in production. So the trailer's from 1976. 
Um, and, uh, and, you know, Star Wars, I think because Star Wars is a story of identity and, uh, you know, I grew up in a single parent household, you know, um, uh, you know, without a father. And so my, my search has been a search, you know, yeah. of identity. And so I identified, you know, with Luke Skywalker, even though I wanted to be cool like Han Solo, you know what I'm saying? Just like everybody else, you know what I'm saying? Um, but, but, uh, that film had a tremendous impact, you know, on me, um, as well as like Spike Lee's work. Um, um, but also there's a, there's an incredible, um, documentary that was nominated for an Oscar, um, several years ago, uh, called I Am Not Your Negro. Um, uh, and it's basically the story of, uh, well, it's like James Baldwin talking about his experience, uh, living in America as a writer, as a black man, um, you know, as a gay black man, and it's, it's powerful. Um, uh, the, I am not your Negro, uh, just as a warning. So the author Jaffa piece, you know, um, has some disturbing images, uh, some curses, uh, the black thought freestyle is, uh, you know, you know, there's some, th there's the use of the N word as well as I am not your Negro, just to kind of give you, you know, a warning on that. Um, uh, so, but yeah, I'm, I, James Baldwin is one of, one of, you know, probably my favorite writer, James Baldwin and Toni Morrison, um, you know, and Ntozaki Shange, but, but, uh, I Am Not Your Negro is, uh, an incredible documentary. And then lastly, um, Francis Ford Coppola's Director's Notebook. Um, I, uh, for, you know, in the box set of The Godfather that came out in 1999, Francis Ford Coppola went over how he directed, how he built his director's notebook to direct The Godfather. And it's a very specific list of questions that he asks himself when he directs each and every scene of a movie, uh, specifically each and every scene of The Godfather. And so, because um, Francis Ford Coppola is a great teacher as well as being a great filmmaker. And so um, I use Francis Ford Coppola's director's notebook as a way to kind of like scrub each scene for all of its creative potential when I'm directing a movie. Uh, and I've since kind of tweaked it, but when I was teaching directing, uh, I used it. And, you know, when I tell, you know, all my friends about it, one of my friends like, you know, cussed me out a couple of months ago because she was like, why didn't you show me this, you know, before I directed my latest movie? I was like, I didn't know you was into that. So was like, you know, you know, moving forward, she's good. You know what I mean? But, uh, but those are, these are like, you know, I mean, many more, but these are like some of my main kind of influences. And that's amazing. And thank you for being so generous and sharing that because sure, I'm sure. running out to get that Francis Ford Coppola. No doubt. Really. Yeah. Amazing. Do you find that writing, does writing come easy to you? No. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's, uh, you know, um, but I do, uh, but I do love it. You know, I, I love the, uh, you know, you start with a blank page and you can fill that page with your hopes and your desires and your fears. Um, um, you kind of create new worlds. Um, you, you, you know, much like, you know, um, teaching a child, you know, it's like your, you know, your child at a certain point, you know, learns something new and like your heart swells because, you know, they've been able to come up with a thought, you know, that really surprises you. Uh, when I'm writing a script, um, you know, you know, my characters start working, they start doing the work and they surprise me. And, you know, I find myself getting emotional. I find myself getting angry. I find myself being delighted, you know, by something that comes out, um, you know, and it's, you know, and it's, and it's me, but it's also, you know, uh, everything that I've been influenced by. It's me and it's, and it's all the kind of cultural memory that's coming out, you know, you know, at the same time. Cause it's like, you know, cultural memory exists. It's like, you know, uh, when you hear James Brown shout, you know, and scream, he's shouting and screaming because he's James Brown, but he's also remembering, you know, uh, his parents, you know, being sharecroppers and, you know, they're remembering, uh, you know, their, their, their parents, you know, when they were slaves, you know, singing in the fields and they're remembering, you know, their African ancestors, you know, when they were involved in ring shouts and so on and so forth, you know, when they were in Africa. So it's, it's a continuum that, that I think is important to tap into the continuum of, of like your history of your past of your consciousness you know what you're into what you love um because you bring all that to bear when you're writing so it's hard you know but but i love it um uh because of the uh, because of the potential uh because you know writing you know 
film, films and, and storytelling uh, changes lives. You know, uh, it, 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 film and storytelling provides people with equipment for living, you know, um, uh, because, you know, when we, when we write, you know, a great uh, a story, we were essentially tapping into universal truths, you know, um, that people uh, may not consciously know or understand, but once we tell our story, they understand it, you know, very, very clearly. And so I just think that that's um, uh, something that I, you know, when I'm writing, something that I look forward to, um, uh, because it is hard, because no one's, no one's telling you to get up in the morning and write, you know, no one's saying you gotta get this done, but you gotta get it done especially if that's how you communicate with the world. And that's one of the ways in which I communicate with the world. That is yeah, amazing, amazing. So on to a few questions. Tamara asks, are there any rituals or exercises you do when going through character design? I assume she means as, as per writing. Yeah, and so, so what I do, what I, what I tend to do, um, and, and I'm, I'm a bit of a masochist with my situation, but what I tend to do is when I have after I've kind of developed like my premise or, or my concept or the initial ideas for how to put together a script, I will do a character bio of each of my main characters. Um, um, uh, usually that character bio is 10 pages, sometimes more. And 10 pages are really random, you know what I'm saying? Because I just, I want to, you know, I want to know about that character from the time they were born all the way up until the start of my movie. And so uh, sometimes I will, you know, fill up uh, a manila folder. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, a, a legal pad, you know, like this right here. This is like one of the scripts I'm working on now. But I'll fill up this whole kind of 32 page legal pad with character bio. Um, and I won't stop until I'm done. Um, and I'll talk about their major relationships. I'll talk about, you know, um, triumphs in their life. Um, you know, I once took a class by uh, Guillermo Arriaga. Um, who wrote um, uh, Babel, who wrote um, uh, Amoris Peros, directed by uh, Inuratu. And, uh, and he had everybody in the class list the 10 experiences that shaped their life the most. Mm -hmm. And so when I write my character bios, I do the same thing now. Like what are the 10 most important experiences that, you know, um, that my character experience. And once I kind of get those down, I'm good. Um, and, and I feel confident. I mean, part of the reason why I'll fill up a legal pad or I'll write 10 pages is because I want to have a certain kind of knowledge and wisdom about my character. But I also, you know, want to be able to have a certain kind of confidence that I know this character a little bit. That doesn't mean that once I finish uh, the 10 pages and once I fill up the legal pad that the character is done uh, because I still have to write the script. But um, uh, that's typically kind of what, you know, I'll do as a ritual. Um, and I'll think about those things. Um, you know, what, what I just told you was character, character biography. Character biography is a list of all the important events, you know, of a character's uh, life. But character backstory are specific events that affect the character as they move through your story. And so I, the, the biography is the context and the backstory, you know, um, you know, is the thing that you want to focus on when you're writing character because, because the backstory elements end up being, you know, going into your script in one way, shape, or form for the most part. And just out of curiosity, so what would be a, an important event that, it, that um, incited where we're finding you now in life? We're finding me now in life? Um, uh... I mean, I think, look, I mean, I think, you know, um, uh, you know, I mean, as a result of all the protests, the anti-police brutality, um, you know, uh, and anti-racism protests that are going on now, um, you know, the, the, you know, seeing the death of, of, of George Floyd, of, you know, seeing that cop kneel on his neck, you know, for almost nine minutes just kind of brought back, um, you know, elements, you know, of my life where I've been, you know, profiled or, you know, or harassed, you know, by cops or, um, or, or I've kind of, or, or when I've experienced an injustice um, because of who I am, you know, and it's, and it's, um, and it's made me think about, you know, now that I've, I've kind of had that, um, 
that kind of come back to me. You know, I see, see what happened to George Floyd, have that come back to me. Uh, you know, I'm faced with the, you know, with the whole notion of, okay, now what do I do? You know, I have this anger, I have this frustration. Um, um, you know, what do I do with that? Um, uh, and how do I, is it something that, that, you know, that I just need to vent? Is it something that potentially makes me productive? Is it something that potentially, you know, uh, uh, you know, makes me destructive? What are the choices that I have as a result of that? And so that's, um, uh, that's where I'm at now. <laughs> that's where I'm, where I'm at now. Oh, that's really, and, and, and as you're going back to before, you know, talking, talk to me about how the power of film could be actually a vehicle yeah yourself and and others to to sort of to put their ideas their emotions their upset yeah out in the world. Yeah, yeah i mean you know i think that one of the things that i that, that that i learned you know just kind of growing up you know in 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 housing projects is and in, in seeing all kinds of different stories um you know i'm i'm reminded of the whole idea um of um Oftentimes, you know, when, you know, when the hood, it's like, you know, there were, there were young people and older people who think that before they act that they don't have any choices. And that, you know, I, I had to do this because I had no choice. And I had to, uh, you, know, you know, I had to, I had to treat somebody in a certain way because I had no choice. And I think, you know, um, the power of storytelling, and I, and I learned this, you know, from Toni Morrison, you know, the power of storytelling, you know, uh, creates an, an, an incredible sense of the potential to create a, an, an, an incredible sense of healing. Mm -hmm. Because you have an opportunity to kind of combat narratives of, of, of hatred into narratives of love. Uh, and so, you know, um, you look at a story like Beloved, Beloved is a story about, you know, a woman who rather than have her, you know, uh, baby daughter, you know, go through slavery, she kills her baby daughter, or, you know, her, her, she kills her, you know, her daughter. And uh, the daughter comes back um, because the daughter wasn't done. The daughter, you know, needed to express herself in a certain way. And, um, and you know, and what happens in the end, I won't give you the ending of it, but what happens, and this is a very, very, you know, uh, slight, you know, you know, kind of, you know, summary of beloved, but what happens in the end, um, you know, gives, you know, that, that the character, uh, a way to heal, mm -hmm. you know, uh, a way to, you know, uh, you know, a way to heal despite an experience where she was a slave, despite an experience where she had to, you know, run north to, to, you know, to Ohio to, to get her children out of slavery, you know, and avoid the whip and avoid, you know, rape and things of that nature. And then she, you know, didn't want a dog. Fish, so she had to, she, so she killed her daughter and, and, but, but, you know, her daughter comes back and, you know, and she has an opportunity to, to overcome her guilt over what happened. Um, you know, and, and by the end, you know, a whole bunch of crazy things happened. But in the end, she, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a measure of healing there. And so, I just think that that's, um, that's, but that's the power of storytelling. You know what I'm saying? That's the power of storytelling. We have an opportunity to do a whole bunch of things. Um, one of the most powerful is, is to heal people. Totally. And, and it seems to me with storytelling, it's, it's the, the ability to tell your story and to yeah. have a voice and be seen. And everyone wants to be seen, you know, right. really seen who they are. Right. And that goes back to, to be able to tell your story goes back to the pur purpose of the 2020 series is about craft. To be able to right. tell a story and tell it effectively yep. and to feel like you've gotten it out there in the world, yep. you need craft. Um, right. and, and definitely, and you're just, you know, this is the last question. How has been being an educator transformed your, your craft? Mm. Um, I think that it's, you know, I mean, that I, I think that it's uh, uh, being an educator. Um, I mean, I think, you know, it's it, one, it's made me into a better person. Um, uh, it's made me into, and, and, you, and you can't be a better artist if you don't become a better person. Um, and it's, it's been inspirational because I think that my students um, that I come into contact with inspire me every day. 
um, because they think about things that didn't that I didn't think about. They, you know, I can see the the power of storytelling to change lives. Um, I think that, and there's an opportunity. You know, the great thing about you know teaching is that you can get someone to believe in the power that they have to create themselves. Mm -hmm. And in creating themselves, they can inspire and change others. So I wouldn't be here without Spike Lee, without George Lucas, without Julie Dash, without Toni Morrison, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, on down the line. And one of the most inspirational quotes that I, that I you know, um, you know, that, that kind of lives in me is the whole idea that if you have, if you have a gift, uh, you have to kind of work that gift to the edge of your ability. You have to be able to, uh, to push you, yourself in that gift um, and, sh and, and, and share it with others. Because if you don't work your gift, if you don't share your gift with the world, then somebody else in the world is lost. And so, you know, we, somebody out there, what I always tell my students is somebody out there needs to see your work because your work, you know, can save them. You know what I'm saying? Your work can inspire them. You know, um, you know, Tim Burton, you know, grew up a goth kid. He grew up alienated. You know what I'm saying? He grew up separate from those folks, you know, uh, around him. You know, I can't even begin to imagine how many people respond in a positive way to Edward Scissorhands, you know what I'm saying? Or, you know, Frank and Weenie, or we can go on down the list, but he knows to talk about marginalized folk, you know what I'm saying? Uh, that's kind of like what he does, you know, Spike Lee and do the right thing, you know, uh, you know, uh, introduced to me, you know, um, what's going on in neighborhoods that were just like my own, um, uh, you know, the, the play for colored girls, you know, talks about the experiences of black women, you know, and what they go through, whether it be relationships or, you know, uh, uh, with, with each other, with themselves. Um, you know, the last line in that, in that play is, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I saw God and I loved her fiercely, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's just, a you know, uh, but it's, it, you got to get your work out there because your work is going to inspire somebody, you know? And if you don't get your work out there, if you're too depressed to do it, you know, I, you know, I get that, you know, we're all kind of going through a malaise right now uh, because of, because of COVID and because, you know, it's just hard having a change in lifestyle, but we also have an opportunity now, you know, to, to do our work because somebody out there needs to see our work. Uh, and so the most uh, important aspect to me about educating people is telling them that and have them go through that process so that people can see their work and be inspired by it and be saved by it. Oh, Randy, you've inspired me. Thank you. So, <laughs> so, good. so we are at the end. Thank it's you. already over. I can't believe it. You know what I'm saying? Well, I can't believe it. I know, I know, we could go on forever. Thank you, 2020 audience. Thank you, New York Film Academy for, you know, putting this out there and, and standing by the show um, and by all your educators and students. And next week we have a seminal uh, Broadway and theatrical producer, Ron S Simmons, who's coming with us. And um, you can reach, you can find Randy at where can, where can people find you? You'll find me, uh, find me on Facebook, Randall Dotton. Find me on IG, Randall Dotton. Find me in the streets of Harlem. I'm always walking around Harlem. This is where I live. Holl at me. <laughs> but six feet away, six feet six, away. Six feet away, six feet, <laughs> wear a mask. You know what I'm saying? Wear a mask. Be a man and wear, and wear a mask. Or be a woman and wear a mask. Or be exactly. anything. Don't be an between. idiot. Be a baby yeah. and wear a mask. It's all good. You know what I mean? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and have a great week. All right. Take care, y'all. Thank you, Liz. Thanks.